So episode 4 of season 3 is finally here and we need to break it down, so let's get straight into it. We begin the episode with a training scene and we finally get a clue as to how many members the children of the Watch have. We also get to see some Vibroblade action, flamethrower action, really just a collection of all Mandalorian related sparring. Grogu plays around in the sand and at first it seems like he's also training in his use of the force, but in actuality the little one is just playing around. Mando puts Grogu up for some real training and Grogu faces off against the foundling Ragnar who we first saw back in episode 1. Bo-Katan advises caution and Mando points out that if Grogu is to graduate from a foundling to an apprentice, he will need to learn. But this little tidbit of information also clues us in on a bit more detail regarding the progression of a Mandalorian, indicating that much like the Jedi who go from youngling to Padawan, the Mandalorians have foundling to apprentice. Grogu is then challenged to a duel of darts, but Ragnar questions why he doesn't wear a helmet, to which Mando explains that Grogu can't recite the creed and therefore is not ready to wear a helmet. In other words, the reason why Grogu doesn't wear a helmet is because those plush toys wouldn't sell as well. Ragnar thinks that Grogu is too young to fight and Mando says, One does not speak unless one knows. Is that not the creed? Which really translates to, the match starts and I half expected Grogu to just yeet Ragnar with the force, but sadly that doesn't happen. Nonetheless, to summarize, Grogu styles on Ragnar well past Vizsla and the armorer watch on. Ragnar gets snatched up by a pterodactyl looking monster, but what's really surprising is that you would think that a bunch of elite warriors would be smart enough to set up a lookout for any incoming danger, especially given that it was not that long ago that they were attacked by a crocodile and apparently this isn't the first time that the bird has snatched up a foundling. The Mandalorians manage to track down the bird thanks to Bo-Katan and as they discuss what to do, she mentions that the nest is no higher than the peaks of Kiramorit. And Kira Morit is actually the name of a stronghold located on Mandalore. The location served as the home of the Mandalorian Skirata clan and actually acted as a refuge for any deserting clones during the Clone Wars and later on during the Age of the Empire. So this is actually a very interesting connection and one that might actually link back to the Bad Batch. The armorer orders the Shriek Hawk training team to help them find the child, and the Shriek Hawk is actually a predatory bird native to Mandalore, and it's also the symbol used by Clan Vizsla and later Death Watch. As the team leaves, Grogu stays back and hangs out with the armorer. The armor then decides to craft another piece of armor for Grogu, but the entire process creates Order 66 flashbacks for the little guy. Now, a lot of people, including myself, have speculated that this might be Syndralic, the legendary Jedi Master, but that seems highly unlikely given how easily they all went down. We then learn that the Jedi are trying to get Grogu to a man named Kaloran, who we later see is also a Jedi. And this is none other than Jedi Master Kaloran Beck, nicknamed the Saber Han and first appeared in a Star Wars game show for kids. But what's even cooler is that Kaloran Beck is actually played by Ahmed Bess, the same actor who played Jar Jar Binks. The elevator door opens and you know for a fact that you briefly thought it was Maze Windu until you saw the green lightsaber. The two manage to escape the Jedi Temple and the subsequent chase scene was very much reminiscent of Anakin and Obi-Wan chasing Zem Wessel in the attack of the clones, especially from the dive to driving through the tunnel. The two pass by the peak of Umaid and approach a landing platform where we see a Naboo royal starship and a squad of the royal Naboo security forces. And the ship that we see here might be the same one that we we saw back in the Phantom Menace, and the same goes for the Royal Naboo security forces as well. And if you pay close attention, you'll actually see that the clones on the platform are now in red armor, indicating that they are part of the Coruscant Guard, the ones that are directly under Palpatine's command, which is different from what we saw at the temple where they had blue paint, indicating that they are a part of the 501st Battalion under Anakin's command. The two continue to be chased by V-Wings before making the jump to hyperspace, leaving us to wonder what exactly happened to Jedi Master Kaloran Beck. We then see that the armor has forged for Grogu a rondel, and a rondel was commonly used in medieval times to protect the armpits, but in the case of Grogu, given his small size, it's big enough to cover his chest. And on the rondel itself, we can also see a mudhorn, the signet of Din Djarin's clan. 
The rescue party makes camp and Bo-Katan learns more about the ways of the Watch, especially about how to eat. We also get a moment where Paz Vizsla tells her to stay by the fire as it is her right as the leader of the war party, signifying his acceptance of her as a member of the Watch. The team manages to scale up to the nest and if you pay close attention, you can actually see the helmet of a Mandalorian, a previous victim of the Raptors. Mando points out that there is a heat signature on another part of the Ness, and we immediately see Paz head towards it. Bo warns him, but we then learn that Ragnar is actually Paz's son, hence the complete lack of caution. And this is an interesting bit of information, and one that might come into play in a later episode. The heat signatures turn out to be baby raptors, and just then the mother returns. And a really cool detail here is that the mother raptor essentially throws up Ragnar, giving it to her children. And the reason for this is very much like the birds in real life. The meal fed to chicks is often first consumed and pre-digested by the mother before using it to feed the chicks, helping them with digestion of more complex meals. However, because Ragnar is wearing Beskar, this has effectively allowed him to live for a short moment. Although not sure how convincing this is given that he only seems to be wearing a Beskar helmet and nothing else. But regardless, this is something that we have seen before with Mando flying into the crate dragon's mouth and Boba Fett surviving the Sarlacc pit. Paz tries to save his son, which causes the raptor to flee, and in the process, Bo-Katan loses a pauldron. Mando is then eventually able to rescue Ragnar and bring down the raptor, which is then eaten by another crocodile. There's always a bigger fish. Ragnar is reunited with Paz Vizsla with the help of Mando, and this might be a significant moment later on when it comes to deciding who will be Mandalore. Given that Paz is the head of one of the most influential clans within the cult, getting his support is going to be important to whoever decides to pursue the throne. And so, Paz's gratitude either towards bo for helping find his son or to Mando for rescuing his son will be important, especially if Bo and Mando end up fighting for the title. The team return back to base and the armorer congratulates bo to which she responds, This is the way. Again symbolizing her acceptance of her newfound faith. We also get to see the chicks be brought to base as well, so we might get to see Mandalorians flying these raptors somewhere down the line. bo gets a new pauldron and she decides to not only wear the signet of the Night Owl, but the Mythosaur as well, symbolizing her commitment to the Mandalorian cause and possibly her desire to be the Mandalorian leader once again. bo breaks the news that she saw the real Mythosaur to which the armor initially assumes that it was a vision. but the Despite Bo-Katan's insistence that she saw a real one, it's not entirely certain if the armorer is convinced, which actually casts some doubts over whether what Bo-Katan saw on Mandalore truly was a mythosaur or simply a vision. Certainly a lingering question to be answered for another time. Throughout the entire episode, a common theme throughout the different plot points was really about safeguarding the future by protecting the young. The entire adventure of the Mandalorians heading off to save Ragnar very much mirrors the events that occurred in Grogu's flashbacks, where the Jedi sacrificed themselves to save Grogu the Jedi youngling. And so despite the completely different philosophies of both religions, it's interesting to see that they do share a commonality, in that both religions see their young ones as the future of their order. And it's also a really nice way of tying in with Grogu's story, as he is the foundling that Mando is always trying trying to protect. And the same can also be said for the mother raptor who was really just trying to feed her children, the future of her species. Oh, and by the way, this episode was directed by Carl Weathers, the High Magistrate himself. So that's all for this breakdown, be sure to let me know what you think in the comments down below and be sure to like and subscribe. I am the Lost Acolyte, and I have spoken.